Uh, the last time I, I was in Australia, I left with the commission uh, from John Gilchrist and Brian Fitzgerald, um, uh, who asked me to write a contribution to their forthcoming, then forthcoming book now published on copyright. The subject that they gave me was, is copyright reform impossible? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, I did the article saying, no, it's not impossible, it's just difficult. Um, and from the conversations I've had in the last couple of days in Canberra and Sydney, uh, it sounds like this remains an open question uh, here in Australia. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is to uh, talk about uh, the copyright reform which has proved possible uh, in the UK uh, following the review that I led in 2010-2011. Uh, I'll offer my own views as to why this particular effort at reforming copyright achieved results. Uh, I'll try to set out the arguments which made the case for reform persuasive in the UK uh, and the political and other conditions which made reform a practical reality. I'll also touch briefly uh, on copyright reform in the European Union uh, because UK intellectual property law is framed at the EU level, uh, at least until June, when the UK votes yes or no to staying in the European Union. The immediate prologue uh, to my review uh, was the Gower's review on intellectual property. Um, which was itself conducted uh, in the context of an ambitious, if possibly somewhat top-down, uh, Digital Britain big strategy rolled out during the Labour Prime Ministership of Gordon Brown. Um, Gowers made 54 recommendations, uh, most of which were ignored or blocked, um, and what was left got swept into a Digital Economy Act, uh, rewritten uh, by lobbyists right on the brink of the 2010 general election. This was uh, legislation that would have made, among many other things, internet service providers uh, much more responsible for the content carried on their systems uh, and obviously uh, was uh, proposed and taken forward uh, as part of uh, a crackdown on the unauthorised use of music and other files on the internet. But the bill did at the time, uh, and with hindsight smack of the kind of sweetheart deal that gets done between politicians nervous about re-election and the entertainment industry. Uh, it didn't work for, for Gordon Brown. He lost the election anyway, uh, and the Digital Economy Act lost its way, first in the courts and then within government. So given this background, the UK copyright world was astonished when in October 2010, just a few months after taking power, the new government, now a coalition led by David Cameron's Conservatives, supported by the Liberal Democrats, stands up and says, let's have another review of intellectual property, the fourth in six years in the UK, uh, and that was when my phone rang. The terms of reference for the review uh, were very, very focused. Even you could say, if you were being critical of them, uh, which I'm not, but you could say monocultural. Full of detail, but in the manner of someone speaking to you who's not quite sure that you're paying attention properly. So I was asked to consider how the IP legal framework could support entrepreneurs, drive economic growth, nurture social and commercial innovation. Competition policy was mentioned, along with new business models appropriate to the digital age. And the Prime Minister specifically instructed me to consider the benefits of an American-style fair use approach to copyright. And he announced uh, that uh, he'd heard directly uh, from people at Google that their view was uh, that if America had had the British system of IP laws, Google would never have made it through the startup phase. The government uh, 
quoting it, the, the, the kind of summary words said it wanted to know how the IP system nationally and internationally can best work to promote innovation and growth in the 21st century with a view to setting the agenda for the long term. It all got boiled down in summary as the Hargreaves Review of Intellectual Property and Growth. Not exactly a bestseller title. <laughs> the time allotted to deliver the review was six months, which I would just like to note before getting into talking about it, is half the time allotted here to the Productivity Commission to do the same job which I think indicates that my personal productivity must be, roughly speaking, twice theirs. <laughs> but seriously, uh, there's clearly lots of shared ground and evidence uh, and thinking between my work and what the Harper Review said on comp uh, IP and competition policy and the issues already uh, formally identified by the Productivity Commission. When you do any work for a government, it matters a great deal to whom you report. So who did I report to? What were my lines? Well, they were officially to the uh, Department of um, uh, Business and Innovation uh, and to the Treasury. And I was provided with uh, an excellent and expert working team, a secretariat, uh, from the Intellectual Property Office. I was also uh, offered um, a, a ready-baked uh, advisory uh, group which uh, I welcomed with uh, the odd tweak and the range of them is interesting. Uh, Roger Burt, uh, an ex-IBM patent expert, Mark Shankerman, an LSE economist interested in pricing effects in the IP system, uh, David Gann, uh, an outstanding innovation specialist now at Imperial College. Uh, Tom Loosemore, a digital expert until recently, a senior figure in the UK government's digital service. And James Boyle, an American law professor, author of The Public Domain uh, and uh, a leading light in the Creative Commons movement. Uh, I took a, 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 a decision that uh, I could take that uh, this group of people should not be held uh, to any requirement to agree with the review's conclusions uh, because uh, I wanted them to be free to argue their hearts out uh, during the review and its discussions and not to be constrained. In terms of the stakeholder starting lineup, the position was uh, pretty predictable. The industries that traditionally depend on copyright, the creative industries, were tetchy and tired but ready for battle, up for it. The pro-reform group was much looser and less visible. It included consumer organisations, technology companies, university researchers, some scientists and curators of museums, libraries and other places of heritage. It soon became clear that if we wanted to speak to the small young technology firms referred to uh, in the terms of reference and by then emerging in quantity in the UK, we would actually have to go find them. They weren't on anybody's email list and they weren't at all organised to respond to government consultations. We received written evidence from over 300 people or organisations. Uh, we ran surgeries at the IPO, set piece debates and pizza nights in Techie Shoreditch. I talked to every MP who was willing to talk to me. Um, I managed very helpfully uh, to get among the senior management of a few uh, of the large content companies to hear for myself off the record actually the very diverse uh, discussions and views that go on inside these businesses uh, but not easily audible behind the ring of steel of their lobbyists. Uh, we also managed a few days uh, out of the UK, uh, talking to Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Boston, Washington, and we touched base in Brussels. Having learned as much as I could about the frustrations of the Gowers Review, I laid down one or two early rules to my own team. 
One stated that we would make only a maximum of 10 recommendations, contrasting with the 54 of Gower's. If you give government 54 options, they'll choose the 14 you least want them to choose. <laughs> so my aim was to deliver a proposition to government which would either be accepted more or less in full or rejected, so that success, if it came, would involve a clear taking of direction on a preferred and distinct course. So what did the review say? Uh, it began... Uh, with the question um, over my shoulder, referring to the world's first copyright law, the Statute of Anne, made in England in 1710. Uh, it replaced the rules established and enforced by private companies with rules carrying the authority of the state. Its goal was to protect the rights of publishers and authors for a term of 14 years. And there's the question that I asked and the answer that I gave to it. I went on to argue that copyright, having been initially the exclusive concern of authors and their publishers, uh, was now charged with um, impeding medical researchers from studying data and text in pursuit of new insights and treatments because it got in the way of text and data mining. With copying now basic to the very mechanics of the internet, along with countless related automated industrial processes and an ever burgeoning digital service economy based on the internet, the UK was at real risk of damaging the innovation engine of digital communications technologies right across the economy, from retail to financial services, not to mention the delivery of public service. So we had to find a way to focus copyright on its vital and continuing role in incentivising creativity, itself an increasingly salient element in innovation, and without it harming research, data analytics, software innovation, and much else. We had to rescue copyright from the position into which it had fallen as well with younger consumers, unable to comprehend how any law could wish to prohibit them from their own everyday acts and, for the better informed young person, the acts of their parents too. Copyright law had slid into a position of disapproval and disrespect from which it needed to return. So for me, the debate between tech-based innovation in the wider economy and the well-being of creative industries was never a binary choice. I've spent almost my entire career in the creative industries and nothing has suffered more digital disruption than the news industry. Look at what's happening in the Fairfax group. But copyright law could not be expected, cannot be expected, to banish or even really to soothe these disruptions. The law and prevailing business models have no choice but to shift. Business knows that. The music had to be faced. So this was not a case of copyright somehow becoming less important. It was the opposite. With IP increasingly salient in digital knowledge-based services economy activities, uh, IP was way too important to be this badly expressed. IP's growing status in the economy can be measured reasonably accurately in a number of ways. In the growth of businesses' investment in an intangible asset base compared with declining investment in tangible assets. Or in studies of the scale of IP usage by businesses. The danger with an IP law that has not kept pace with digital change is that it becomes economically inefficient. It imposes unnecessarily high transaction costs and it blocks new entrants. If monopoly rights last too long or can't be reasonably and readily licensed, competition suffers and that further decreases the likelihood of innovation. 
And when innovation is set back in this way, the effect is felt in productivity numbers, which have been pretty much stagnant in Europe for the last decade. A recent study in the UK by Nesta, an organisation which specialises in the study and promotion of policies with regard to innovation, suggests that the UK digitally, digital tech economy is growing at almost three times the rate of the economy as a whole. And the smaller challenger companies, which are such an important part of this ecology, are the most likely to be negatively affected by badly framed IP laws. So my review's first chapter makes that argument about the relationship between innovation and the IP system in some detail. I think it is uh, a narrative widely supported by economists, of whom I am not one. It also makes the case here for policy and regulatory decisions based upon checkable evidence where that's available. I have to say, not a consideration applied in recent years to extensions of the duration of copyright into the century plus zone, with terms of life plus 50 to 70 years now normal and in defiance of any economic logic, economic logic of which I'm aware. The music industry, in identifying as its number one problem of the digital age, the mass disobedience of its customers, to be dealt with by ever more aggressive enforcement of an unreformed and confusing law which failed to recognise a revolution of circumstance. By doing that, rights holders were, I'm afraid, guilty of taking too narrow a view. So my review argued that the balance between the interests of producers and consumers, not to mention the hybrid prosumers um, burgeoning in the digital age, just had to be adjusted. We had to have what I called, quoting, more open, contestable and effective global markets in digital content. And through that, we would find our way back to a time in which the enforcement of copyright becomes effective once again. At the same time, reform also, the opportunity, uh, reform also offered the opportunity uh, to deal with a range of striking problems in the public sphere, such as the marooning of vast quantities of orphan works, unusable because no one knows who owns the rights to them and no processes exist to get round that along with countless other items, I'm sure there are people in this room who know all about this, stowed away in archives where curators lacked the legal power even to copy them for preservation, let alone to share them. So I made 10 recommendations, which let's just find them here. So I don't have to read them all out. You'll see that there are, uh, they're not all concerned with copyright. There are things about the European, European Unitary Patent. Uh, there's um, uh, there's a, a move on design, which is actually an extension of IP coverage. Um, but the most controversial changes, and probably the ones of most interest in this room, was the carrying into UK law uh, of a list of additional exceptions to copyright allowed under the EU framework, which the UK has to work with, but not written into law previously by the UK government. Uh, you'll also see the recommendation about the establishment of a digital copyright exchange, an interoperable set uh, of databases, which was uh, my suggestion to the creative industries about how they might proceed with moving the licensing system from its current uh, very unevenly fragmented um, uh, mode of operating to something that would be digitized uh, and, uh, for small transactions, automatic, uh, and would open up new markets uh, in the long tail of rights-protected material. The review uh, making these recommendations was published in May 2011, 
And the government's initial response, broadly accepting the review's conclusions, appeared in August. It was signed uh, not only uh, by the two ministers to whom I'd reported, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Vince Cable, the Business Secretary, uh, but also Jeremy Hunt, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Ding! Uh, here was a sign of determination from the top of government that this time reform would not be ripped apart by the polarisation of stakeholders um, mirrored in interdepartmental rivalry within the government. In their statement, the three ministers promised a full legislative response to the review and that duly emerged, using a number of vehicles to transport the different elements in, legislation, in the legislation to the statute book. Uh, this covered the uh, identified exceptions, uh, also including a bar on those exceptions being overridden by, by private contract. Uh, it included the design extension, orphan works, and the digital copyright exchange, uh, along with a number of other interesting, uh, if more minor, actions like a code of practice for co collecting societies. In my view, continuingly important, indeed vital, in the system, uh, but uneven uh, in their embrace of uh, digital technology uh, and uh, therefore uh, capable, in some cases, of improvement. Um, the commitment to evidence-based policy decisions was um, mainly uh, a, genuine, a, a general piece of preaching by me, uh, but it did also result in an action, which was investment in a new copyright research centre uh, in the UK at Glasgow University, which has been a very important step forward for the longer term. Uh, and it included um, uh, ideas about enhanced and better targeted enforcement machinery uh, against uh, uh, major commercial offenders uh, and signalling the need for better coordination between agencies, uh, all of which uh, has been carried forward in various ways since the review. Uh, there was also, as a final point, um, a call for a small claims channel for I to resolve IP disputes, and that also has been carried into effect. The immediate stakeholder reaction, what was that like? Well, the loose confederation of those in favour of reform didn't express itself in a highly coordinated way, uh, but as an example, the Open Rights Group, one of the more experienced campaigners in the field, called the review the design manual for a 21st century copyright policy, balancing copyright in the interest of creators, consumers and innovators. Consumer groups echoed that. From the rights holders, though, where did they go? The top-line response on the, on the day of publication, so I was sitting in radio and television studios expecting to defend myself against an onslaught, uh, the top-line response was an expre expression of satisfaction and relief that the review had not recommended a switch to fair use. Uh, one leading trade body even complimented the review on its commitment to, quote, maintaining a true market, unquote. This relief at the absence of the demon of fair use in the recommendations may also explain why parliamentary scrutiny of the review, though voluminous, uh, by specialist committees and then by Parliament itself, was by the standards of copyright debate quite polite, um, uh, though not without the odd moment of personal venom just to liven things up. From, from the government's point of view, probably the most welcome response came from the House of Commons Business and Innovation Committee, which a year after the review and following detailed hearings urged the government simply to get on with what it called the more rigorous approach to policy formation recommended. 
It actually took another two years, so almost four years in all, to clear all the legislative fences, by which time the spirit of polarisation re-expressed itself in a sweeping attack from the Commons Culture, Media and Sport Committee, uh, but that came, who knows, perhaps deliberately, too late to make much difference. <coughs> so why, you may ask, did we not commend an American-style fair use system for the UK? There were two main reasons. Sniffing around, uh, off the record, uh, I tried to understand what the government's law officers would think about that matter. And I came away with what felt to me like, you know, a pretty much a warning in neon lights, not that the law officers ever operate using technology of that kind, um, uh, but uh, I think I was told uh, that the, re the review's proposals were a dead duck uh, if, uh, uh, if, we, if we propose that. Um, so combined with uh, obvious and expected hostility from rights holders, this looked like a recipe for deadlock. F and following the previous and recent experience of the Gowers Review and the Digital Economy Act, I thought that would do more damage to the UK than anything else. Another failure was something which just couldn't be tolerated. It would make, it would make the, the UK look like a place incapable of keeping up digitally. S secondly, even to a non-lawyer like myself, it seemed implausible that the UK should, could take such a large step towards fair use without some formal modification of the EU framework within which UK IP law sits. That was not likely to be available quickly, or maybe at all it looked like another block. Jamie Boyle disagreed with that, uh, and his reasons for it uh, are a matter of record enjoy reading them uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Fair use seemed, seems to me, however, to offer two primary advantages over a list of flexible exceptions. One, it presents to the public as simpler. It's basically the idea that there's a principle here uh, of rights ownership which people will disagree about and where disagreement occurs, it gets settled in the courts. Now, I think that my teenage children could understand that pretty well, uh, more easily than uh, a list of exceptions pointing to very specific things that uh, maybe don't concern them so directly. But the second and larger thing in favour of fair use is that it makes the law itself more adaptable to changing waves of technology, which are bound to be, uh, is bound to be the case looking ahead as it has been in the last 10, 20 years. Obsoles obsolescence of the law is built in uh, and the courts can keep, if not right up with the pace, they can keep closer to the pace than the processes of statutory lawmaking are likely uh, to be able to match. But there are arguments on the other side against fair use. I'll match those two with two. By putting power, so much power, in the hands of the courts, fair use takes power away from politicians, the makers of statute law in a democracy. Critics say that fair use also would inevitably encourage more litigation, too much litigation, and the related expense. Secondly, any country embracing fair use should perhaps also reflect upon the fact that its undoubted settled effectiveness in the, in the American context um, does rest to a considerable degree on the fact that at the highest level, differences between courts in the United States uh, uh, refer back uh, to the Constitution of the United States, stating the inviolability of freedom of expression, freedom of the press. Freedom of expression issues, although they were not what I was asked to uh, consider, and I didn't uh, uh, discuss freedom of expression, 
but those issues do hang like a mist uh, around copyright law. And having spent a couple of days in Hong Kong on the way here this week, um, anyone who's followed the Hong Kong debate and the recent collapse of its attempt to update copyright law will see what a big uh, role the free expression concern has played in that. So why, putting it all together, were we able to succeed with reform in the UK in this particular period of history, 2011 to 2015, when previously reform had been impossible? I suggest four factors. One, the fact that from the beginning the reforming thinking was required to address economic issues uh, gave it focus and spoke to, I'm sure, the, the correct popular priority in the wake of the financial crisis, the banking crisis of 2008, uh, and the effects of that crisis and other disruptions in the global economy continue to be keenly felt. The second, the novelty at the time of a fixed five-year parliament. The UK hadn't had fixed parliaments. It had had parliaments that could be ended um, if there was some kind of uh, political difficulty that resulted in uh, uh, the government deciding to resign and go to the country. Uh, it took six months to conduct the review, as I've said, and four years to coax new legislation through parliament. The process was made more orderly uh, by there not being a movable uh, end-of-the-line deadline. And I think that was um, very, uh, very helpful, to put it at its least. Uh, third, I think we had the undertow of uh, MPs. The longer and the more time goes on, the more MPs, there are not many uh, yet born digital, there are one or two, um, but... Uh, there are more MPs who've grown up digital. Uh, they get digital better than they did five years previously. And fourth and finally, the emergence of streaming as an authorised digital business model supported by subscription advertising or both has probably turned the tide on the, the, the scale of the piracy problem for music online and it will also... Uh, it is pretty clear, play a significant role in the evolution of business models in film and television as the internet offers the bandwidth necessary to do those businesses without traditional broadcasting technologies or as well as traditional broadcasting tele um, technologies. So, closing up, where are we now? In the UK, I think noise levels are down. I think that the UK government is entitled to think that it made good use of bad weather. <sighs> and in terms of the, uh, the well-being of the creative industries, uh, they're doing really well. Uh, in recent years in the UK, uh, they've grown consistently faster than the economy as a whole. The creative economy, which is creative jobs and inputs across the whole economy, not just the creative industries, is also nicely outpacing general economic growth. And that now accounts for one in eight UK jobs, which is itself bigger than the financial services sector. So the, the, the music industry, now artists are making good and skillful use of digitally uh, inexpensive um, uh, 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 phenomena uh, like the ability to build communities of fans in different ways and the live music scene uh, is growing at double digit rates. Music tourism is strong, UK artists made five of the ten top selling albums in 2015 and the commercial business model has now got streaming as an option. Music is more available in more places than ever before, and most people in the music industry would agree, I think, that that's a huge positive. Equally important, though, is the fact that in the last two years, the wider UK tech scene has also gained momentum. 
Tech City is well established in London and connected to a wider and growing tech nation phenomenon which has some hot or at least warm spots away from London. If you take something like the fintech sector supporting uh, financial services, uh, I think it's reasonably widely agreed that the UK has established itself as a, if not the, leading player in Europe. When it comes to economic impact, how you translate that into calculations about economic growth is controversial. Um, uh, government economists put economic impact assessment numbers uh, on, uh, on my review. Um, uh, we published them in the review, and I noted uh, how unreliable uh, exercises of that kind are. But I don't believe that there is any significant uncertainty attaching to the core argument on which the review was based. The internet is a general technology. It is the technology of our time. It affects everything. And so it is the primary engine of innovation for the whole economy. And laws and regulations that get in the way of that demand review and, if necessary, reform. Copyright has fallen into that category, and the law will continue to require updating. Last thought on Europe. What is going on there? Well, uh, the, um, the distinguished um, Professor Bernd Hugenholz from the University of Amsterdam and a leading authority on European copyright uh, long ago characterised the current European uh, Information Directive, which uh, governs copyright, with these words. He called it a badly drafted, compromise-ridden, ambiguous piece of legislation which does not increase legal certainty, a goal frequently stated in the directive's recitals. But it instead creates new uncertainties by using vague and in places almost unintelligible language. Both the current and the previous president of the European Commission Mr. Barroso, now Mr. Juncker, have acknowledged the difficulties and argued for bold reform. And we'll see in the coming weeks whether we get anything resembling that. And that will determine whether or not Europe starts moving towards the emergence of a European digital single market. If it doesn't do that, Europe will be continuing to live without the borderless, borderless continental scale market in digital services and products enjoyed by both China and the United States, and I regard that as a major problem for Europe if we can't get through it, but Europe is not in great shape to make big, bold moves. Those are problems that Australia does not have, and I look forward perhaps in discussion now to hearing uh, how you think any of that uh, reflects upon or makes an impact on the conduct of uh, the copyright debate here in Australia. Thank you. Professor Hargraves, Louise Dodson from Universities Australia. Just wondering um, how important, it, it seems like it's important um, in the UK <coughs> experience to have a sort of um, I don't want to diminish what, what's been done, obviously, but a sort of baby steps approach rather than a revolution to fair work, fair use, um, because of sort of proving uh, that it didn't demolish creative industries. How important do you, do you think that is? Well, the, the, the proving or the baby steps or the... Well, the, the taking a gentle approach, I guess, um, to, well, so reforming what you have yes. rather than, uh, you know, opting for a completely new mm. system and um, the ability that gives you to show that it's doable and it's not a giant problem for the creative mm. industries. Well, uh, you know, my approach can be summed up, has been summed up by others as uh, the art, uh, the, the deployment of the art of the possible. Uh, uh, and that was, um, that was the primarily self-limiting consideration that was in my mind. Um, uh, uh, I think I explained, and so I, I won't repeat, uh, why uh, I thought that um, uh, going further would have got us less far uh, than some uh, well-choreographed baby steps. Uh, 
I, I, don't, I don't at all mind them being called baby steps. Uh, uh, I just uh, will look uh, to the way that uh, British universities will start to be able to catch up with the deployment of digital research techniques uh, on uh, uh, and uh, if we can get the change at European level, we might get change at European level on text and data mining. Uh, that will be uh, an enormous boost uh, for collaboration between European universities, which uh, at present is highly problematic. Uh, if you speak to, uh, I don't know whether there's anybody from the UK here, from uh, the likes of Universities UK or whatever, but uh, th th that's certainly what they think. Uh, Fiona Phillips from the Australian Copyright Council. Uh, very interesting to hear you speak, Professor Hargreaves. Um, I suppose maybe following on a little bit from what Louise was saying, and maybe this uh, reflects my bias as a former bureaucrat who worked on <laughs> some, of, some of our current laws in Australia. Um, one could cynically say that, that the reforms that the UK has uh, implemented in recent times have brought it up to speed uh, with the reforms that Australia implemented in 2006. So if we've already done the possible, uh, where do you think what position do you think that leaves Australia in now? Uh, because we have many of, many of the things that, that uh, the UK intro introduced, for example, the, uh, the, the ill-fated private copying exception, of fair dealing for parody or satire, etc. We, we've had for a decade in Australia, or well, by the end of the year it will be a decade. Um, so where do you, th what room, I appreciate that you're, uh, in what you've observed, do you think we have to move in Australia now? Well, I think uh, the most straightforward answer to that question is to say uh, that uh, Australia is not inhibited uh, by the things that inhibited me uh, uh, reporting on the situation in the UK in 2011 uh, by the things that uh, made me uh, uh, certain uh, that uh, arguing fair use was not, it was not the right time and not the right place to argue that. Uh, I think you could argue uh, that Australia uh, uh, is a place where that could be argued and I know it's been argued previously, fruitlessly, uh, although these things are never, never fruitless. Uh, uh, the, 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 next, uh, the next go round the course learns from the previous one um, and I'd be a bit surprised, although I'm uh, the least expert person in the room on Australian uh, copyright, um, but I'd be a bit surprised if that is not a question uh, about to re-emerge uh, into the Australian discussion. Hi, David Ferris with 21st Century Fox. The first bullet says you need to have policy uh, with that is evidence-based. And how do you go about collecting that evidence base? If I recall properly from your review, there was research conducted by Google that analyzed or surveyed digital SMEs in the UK and only 7% identified copyright as a barrier. When you went to Silicon Valley, in your report you indicated that actually copyright wasn't the top barrier that even Silicon Valley identified. They identified the culture of investment, um, the culture of business risk taking, and things such as that. And actually, building the evidence base from economic analysis proves difficult, which I think is evidenced by the fact that government's impact assessment of your proposals was 98% less than your economic impact assessment of the benefits of the proposal. So it seems very difficult, and it seems that the proposal, the evidence base is actually fairly weak for change. So could you please s express how you might build up that evidence base in a more rational and reasonable way mm. to, s to facilitate su such massive change? Well, uh, I, I dispute that the change is massive, uh, or uh, uh, I, I, it's just been called baby steps. Um, uh, uh, what, uh, what I do think is that um, uh, th there are some uh, unchangeable difficulties about copyright 
uh, in terms of having the kind of data um, baseline uh, that uh, economists would want to have because it's an unregistered right. Uh, it's uh, not possible to research it the way you can research issues around patent. Um, so uh, that's, that's one type of limitation that exists. Um, when uh, uh, you know, uh, I drew attention in the review uh, to some examples of um, uh, claims based upon data that were so widely at variance. I mean, a good example, they're there in the review in detail. Uh, it was the, uh, the range of uh, claims or estimates made of uh, the monetary uh, uh, cost of and scale of the damage being done by, uh, by piracy. Uh, uh, and you got enormously wide spreads uh, from different pieces of work. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the, bu the building of a confident um, uh, evidence base uh, will take time. Uh, and uh, I uh, had a little bit of a moment of success uh, by uh, getting uh, the government or I think through the IPO uh, to put some funding into uh, having getting Ofcom, uh, who commissioned somebody else to get uh, some uh, better quality research on what was going on in infringement. And actually, the, those uh, sequences of research, uh, are, are, it's a very good piece of work. Uh, it confirms uh, that infringement is a substantial issue, uh, but it doesn't confirm uh, the, the wilder extremes that, uh, that are argued about that. So that's the kind of thing uh, that, that we can do. Uh, there is a debate, uh, academics certainly debated, I'm not sure anybody else is much debating it, uh, about whether or not uh, copyright should become a registered right, uh, if this is going to be a right uh, that lasts, you know, whether it's you know, my next email to you, uh, or uh, you know, the, uh, the, the most successful piece of classical music to emerge in the next year, it's going to be covered uh, by copyright uh, for uh, this uh, uh, very long period of time. I think that, that, uh, uh, th those kinds of issues uh, uh, are capable of being um, uh, discussed in a, in a better evidence-based manner. Uh, but you're right to say uh, that flawed evidence, uh, it, you know, it, flawed evidence is part of life. Uh, deliberately flawed evidence is something else. I don't think many people uh, deal in deliberately flawed evidence, but some people do. Uh, Graham Greenleaf, University of New South Wales. Uh, Professor Hargraves, uh, I'd uh, like to get a little bit more information about your recommendations concerning data analytics and the problems you perceive at EU level. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming your recommendations uh, include that if an organisation has a legitimate copy of a, of a database, a set of data, then using data analytics over that data, even though it might involve technical copyright breaches, uh, there'll be an exception to allow that use. My question is, um, if an organisation uses, for example, the robot exclusion protocol to stop web spiders uh, copying uh, its data set, uh, do your recommendations uh, in any way override that and essentially allow unrestricted data mining, or does it only apply uh, when an organisation has an otherwise legitimate copy of data? Uh, it, it applies when an organisation has an otherwise legitimate uh, copying uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah, uh, right of access. Yeah. Um, uh, the um, I mean the the. the uh, the text and uh, the, the the European law is being rediscussed at the moment, uh, so uh, we don't know yet uh, how that is going to turn out. Um, uh, the the big discussion, and it's familiar under various headings of copyright law discussion, uh, is uh, do we um, uh, make a change that affects only what is termed non-commercial? Uh, uh, research activity, text and data mining activity, uh, or do we uh, uh, include, do we not make that distinction with commercial? I think it is increasingly difficult and problematic 
to make a distinction between non-commercial and commercial, uh, not least because universities, certainly the one I work in, uh, is uh, uh, constantly aware uh, of uh, the uh, pressures upon us, I, in my view, not a bad thing at all, uh, to collaborate uh, more intensively and creatively uh, with, uh, with the private sector and indeed with the public sector outside the university. So um, uh, uh, how that's going to turn out at the European level, I, don't, I can't answer, but that's where we are at the UK level.